Ignatius Crump, An Uncanny by Jacob Gray. Victorian England was in its last throes of greatness. It was the 1890s, a period remembered as the fin de siècle. In the north of England there were newly wealthy barons of industry, who had made great fortunes from coal-fired factories. Many of their workers had died working in these great brick edifices that produced essential wares. No one cared. Originally from very humble origins, Lord Taymouth had been very recently ennobled to the peerage. He had made his fortune from sanitary ware ceramics. His factories had made him a great fortune. Now, in his late sixties, he had bought himself an estate in Yorkshire, cobbled together from the scraps of more ancestral peers' lands. Naxholm was Lord Taymouth's estate, a great and ugly baronial edifice of a house. The landscape was modelled with ponds and trees, all correct for his desired pursuit of fox hunting. Time passed, and the Taymouth estate slowly began to bed in and become part of Yorkshire's ennobled landscape. Great estates of that period had some very distinct requirements. These included having a walled garden with glass houses the sole purpose of such an enterprise being to produce fruit, flour and vegetables for the big house. Now, in his early seventies, Lord Taymouth had devoted himself to country pursuits and the aggrandizing of his estate. His greatest personal devotion was to the creation of a great collection of trees and exotic plants to grace his estate. He read all the important books on the subject of horticulture and had become quite enthusiastic on the subject. Lord Taymouth began to sponsor explorers in far-off lands, in the vain hope of discovering a new plant species. He generously subscribed to many learned institutions to send brave and bold men out to these remote lands on such missions. The only requirement that Lord Taymouth stipulated in his gifting of money was the return of a viable plant seed. He had spent a great fortune in the building of heated glasshouses at the estate. For the return of reams of note-taking and a few exotic seeds, Lord Taymouth was happy to sponsor nearly every would-be plant hunter of the age. "'I am very glad to employ your good self,' Lord Taymouth said as he shook the hand of his latest garden employee. Lord Taymouth had been very keen to employ an expert in exotic plant care and nurture. He had personally interviewed each candidate for the post. Ignatius Crump was the man he chose for the post. Ignatius was a red-haired fellow with a patchy complexion. He had fat hands. Only his qualifications had endeared him to Lord Taymouth. Lord Taymouth had given Ignatius a superior post as head keeper of heated glass and chief carer of, ex of exotic plants at Naxum. There could be no greater achievement than the, than the naming of a new plant species after me, Lord Taymouth exclaimed to Ignatius. Every seed and root that is sent to my glass house, you must make every effort to propagate. From every far off land they send plant life, and I want a discovery. Ignatius smiled and nodded at his lordship. Ignatius knew what was expected, and he threw himself into the task. There were seeds and moss packed root specimens sent nearly every month to Lord Taymouth's great estate. Ignatius would receive and catalogue every specimen he was sent. After all, his lordship did pay a great subscription to so many plant-hunting expeditions. Orchids, palms and other exotic flowers were grown in the glorious heat of the glasshouses. Everything seemed of great interest, Ignatius. Brightly coloured flowers, fern-like leaves, twirling tendrils, insect-devouring leaves, all caught the attention of Ignatius' mind. Sadly, every newly propagated plant failed to inspire his lordship. Whenever shall we find a plant worthy of carrying my name? I shouldn't care to have my name Latinized in memory of any of these lurid plants. Ignatius, you must propagate a superior plant for me, Lord Taymouth bemoaned on one of his frequent visits to the glass houses. Ignatius Crump was worried about his lordship's desire to have a plant named after him. Would it not jeopardize his own position if he could not find something suitable? He'd been in post for several years and still no plant he had propagated had met with his lordship's approval. Then one day, a package from Africa arrived. It contained several large beans, wrapped in damp moss. Ignatius read the covering note. Dear Lord Taymouth, I have gathered the enclosed seed in a province of Belgian-owned African jungle. A most unusual species, unrecorded. Take all efforts to propagate. Use heat and steam, as these are the principal features of where the seed was gathered. <laughs>
Ignatius leaned back in his chair and picked up a couple of the large beans. Such odd large seeds and such a heavy coat on them. I doubt they'll need scold to break them from quiescence. Ignatius took the large beans and planted each one individually in a large pot of compost. These pots he took to the great heat of his stove house, where precious orchid were grown, and pineapples were forced for his lordship's table. Good luck, little beans. I do hope you flourish. His lordship is mighty keen on naming some plant or other in his memory. It was less than a fortnight later, when one of the seeds sprouted. No other pot showed any sign of activity. Ignatius took every care with the one germinating plant, and placed it on a shelf with the most tender night-flowering orchids. He tipped out the pots and examined the other seeds. He could not fathom what had retarded their development. His sole consolation was that one plant which had sprouted a solitary seed leaf. Ignatius had become accustomed to inspecting his glass houses in the evening. The garden staff were gone by then, and he had freedom to inspect everything. It was a pleasant evening, and Ignatius decided that he have one last look at the orchids in the stove house. He unlocked the door and walked through the anteroom unlocking the second door into the stove-house proper. He was stunned to see the newly sprouted plant had formed a greatly swollen cluster of tightly folded bright green leaves. The plant sat among the white night-blooming orchids, quite swollen and almost resembling a conical-shaped lettuce. Ignatius was delighted. He picked up the clay pot and turned the plant to examine it from every angle. Quite full of promise, Ignatius exclaimed, and he returned the plant to the company of the shelf of orchids, he turned, smiling to himself, and locked the stove-house doors behind him. The following day, Ignatius was quite excited at the thought of revisiting the plant. Surely the expectant swollen bud of leaves would have unfurled in the daylight. Surely there would be an exotic bloom. Surely his lordship would be delighted with the flower and claim naming the plant. Sadly for Ignatius, when he unlocked the doors to the stove-house, the plant was still sitting the same as before a tightly swollen cluster of leaves, standing proud on a clay pot. Bother it, Ignatius complained. He quite forgot the plan for the rest of the day. Such was the busy nature of his day. It was August, and his lordship was expecting house guests. Flowers, fruits, and vegetables were to be supplied to the house. Late in the evening, a note was sent to the gardens from his lordship. He demanded that several bouquets of white orchids were to be harvested, to be given as gifts to the lady guests. It was with a somewhat heavy heart that Ignatius went to carry out the task. He hated having to cut the flowers of his prized stove-house plants. He unlocked the stove-house door. He stepped into the anteroom. He was carrying a trug basket and some secateurs. He unlocked the second door to enter the stove-house proper. Ignatius dropped his basket and stood staring. He gasped loudly. The swollen cluster of leaves had opened. Ignatius stood staring in disbelief at the plant in the pot. He could not believe what he was seeing. There was what appeared to be human hand sticking out of the unfurled cluster of bright green leaves. Ignatius stood staring, unaware of the loud gulping sound he was making. He was dumbstruck. The seed he had planted had sprouted. The tightly swollen cluster of leaves had unfurled, and instead of flower there was a human hand. Goodness me, this is quite unfathomable. Ignatius finally spoke. The hand that was growing out of the pot seemed to react to his voice. It began to thrash around, its fingers grasping at the air. Ignatius crossed himself in fear and ran out of the stove-house. He had managed to lift a nearby pot of orchids, and he ran down to the house. The following day Ignatius was hesitant about returning to his work. He hadn't slept at all well, and he delayed going to attend the glass-house. The other gardeners noticed that Ignatius wasn't his usual industrious self. With a sharp intake of breath, he lifted the key to the stove-house. He marched out of the potting shed and went to see what was there. He threw open the first door of the stove-house and crossed the anteroom, opening the next door. He didn't shut the first door. He might require a quick escape. Cautiously, he peeked into the richly heated glass-house. The pungent scent of orchids filled the air. He stared at the bench. The extraordinary sight of the night before was not there. The plant sat as tightly furled up, bud of bright green leaves.